Okay, so um, where I was last time was starting to talk about the acute radiation toxicities, and I, I gave you a bit of a, an introduction uh, to it, and I said we're going to get into it in a lot more detail, and I also reminded you that every uh, radiobiology exam you'll ever do in your lives will involve um, this, uh, th this information I'm going to give you. Now, in my opinion, um, this chart is probably among the most important. Um, so, uh, oh my God. <coughs> so um, this gives the three major organ systems that fail, um, the dose range, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go over this. The hematopoietic syndrome, as we said last time, was the lowest dose syndrome, kicks in between two and a half to 10 gray. Now, I don't want you to think that, oh, there are no symptoms if it's under two and a half gray. No, we saw last time that there are symptoms of the um, uh, hematopoietic syndrome at lower doses. It's just that they're not likely to be lethal. Um, the latent period is two to three weeks. Um, at, during that period of time, there'll be no symptoms. We'll talk about why that is in a few moments. Um, the underlying cellular event is that there is death of bone marrow cells. Um, we'll look at a bone marrow from a person that's been uh, lethally irradiated. Um, anorexia and nausea vomiting are, are the, uh, what would be experienced in the prodromal period. As I said, pretty common for all of these. But then during the principal phase, this is where it's different. We're going to see petechia and purpura, bleeding from mucous membranes, and infection is going to set in. The time to death with no intervention is two to three weeks, and they will die of bone marrowplasia and bacteremia. Now, this is the one syndrome we can interfere with. We'll talk about the means of interfering uh, in a little bit, but that involves both the use of uh, cytokines, and in some examples, it involves the use of bone marrow transplants, but I need to say that that's somewhat controversial um, because in the example of Chernobyl that we'll talk about in a few moments, um, a lot of the uh, bone marrow transplants were not effective. They gave rise to graft versus host reactions. Um, the GI syndrome is the next uh, highest dose sy symptom syndrome. And this has a latent period of three to seven days during which time there are no symptoms. Um, the dose range is usually 10 to 50 gray. Although again, as I said, there are not that many cases that have been studied adequately. And so therefore we don't really know um, the precise cutoffs here. Uh, the underlying cellular effect now is going to be death of uh, the mucosal stem cells that line the gut. Uh, anorexia, nausea, vomiting again for the prodromal period. But during the principal phase, we're gonna see fever, bloody diarrhea, loss of fluids and electrolytes, death without inter any, actually death is gonna mean five to 12 days. And this is a syndrome that we cannot interfere with. We don't have uh, many treatments here. Um, the, uh, at autopsy, one would find uh, that there's uh, mitotic arrest in the crypts. There are mucosal erosions throughout the entire uh, gut. And finally, the highest dose syndrome is what's called, in some cases it's called CNS syndrome, in some it's called acute incapacitation syndrome. Um, this usually it has a latent period of 15 minutes to three hours, so it's got a very short latent period. Um, the dose range is 50 gray or higher. The underlying cellular effects, because there are so few cases that have been identified, are really not clear, but I believe it's due to both um, death of endothelial cells that line uh, the blood vessels, so there's a breakdown of the vasculature, and death of neurons. Neurons are not uh, very radiosensitive, they're pretty radio resistant, but at these doses we get death of the neurons as well. Um, during the prodromal phase we have uh, nausea and vomiting, but now we have anxiety, confusion, ataxia, apathy. During the principal phase we're going to see the apathy, but the lethargy, somnolence, uh, extreme tremors and convulsions, eventually the person will go into a coma, um, they'll die. This, this is incorrect, it should be 10 to 49 hours because the one there is one case we'll talk about that lived for 49 hours. And autopsy, we're going to see cerebral edema, microvasculitis, and necrosis of isolated neurons. Now, the way that they're going to ask this on the boards is not going to be, what is the dose for acute incapacitation syndrome? No, they're going to say a patient has presented in the hospital 
they had been exposed to uh, some dose of unknown dose of radiation three hours ago. They're showing confusion, ataxia, apathy. Uh, what 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 um, dose did they get? And you're going to have to know it's going to be 50 gray or higher. Or what's their time to death? And you're going to have to know that it's from the time of exposure uh, between 10 and 49 hours. So they're going to ask it from an application perspective rather than just um, uh, what are the raw facts that are present on this in this uh, chart. I also want to mention one other thing that's confusing here. That is that they give a lethal range in gray. These gray are all for gamma rays and x-rays. If they would be neutrons, they would be quite different because neutrons are so much more damaging per unit dose. But we always express uh, deterministic effects like acute radiation syndromes that do have a dose threshold, we always express them in gray. It's concerns about stochastic effects like cancer that we express in Siebert. And we'll talk about that later, but I wanted to draw it to your attention now. Okay, so we're gonna take these one by one. Let's start with the cerebrovascular syndrome. Also called neurovascular syndrome, also called acute incapacitation syndrome. Total grace of dose of 50 gray or higher, um, or the equivalent. So if it were neutrons, it might be only, you know, five gray of neutrons if they have a quality factor of 10 or something like that. These patients don't just have CNS syndrome, they have GI syndrome and bone marrow syndrome as well, but they're not gonna be long enough to be able to see it. Um, there are only two reported cases that have been identified in the open literature. There are lots of other cases that have been identified, uh, but let's use these two cases to tell us uh, what um, the first is from a uranium-235 recovery plant. <clears throat> this was done uh, out in the Western U.S. Um, the person received an 80 gray, 88 gray total dose. It was a combination of 22 gray of neutrons, which had a quality factor of about 10, so this is a pretty whopping dose. 66 gray of um, gamma rays. Person died 49 hours later. The first day they had headache, vomiting, diarrhea. Second, they were restless, couldn't maintain blood pressure, and eventually died. The second case is a critical, criticality accident at Los Alamos National Lab. The person was exposed to an unknown dose of radiation, someplace between 39 and 120 gray of combined neutrons and gamma rays, went into immediate shock, died within 35 hours. They think that the um, death was due to collapse of endothelial cells and neurons. Here is uh, the one, the first case, this guy died in uh, uh, 49 hours. Um, this, the, the exposure was in Woods River Junction. Here's, here are the data on case number two. Um, I did not get this from the American literature. I pulled it from a German uh, source. Uh, but it's still in the open literature, so it can be discussed. Um, they, they were, it was a plutonium re recycling situation, and we're going to hear about these accidents with plutonium that are very, very common. They had two solutions of plutonium, which they were mixing, and while one is supposed to be poured carefully into the other, instead they just poured them together, um, and they had different densities. They reached criticality. It occurred in 1958. The average dose was between 39 and 49 gray delivered to the upper half of the body. So you see it just falls barely within that uh, CNS syndrome, but because these were a combination of neutrons and gamma rays, the dose is actually much higher or the equivalent dose would be much higher. Um, 40 year, years old, he was standing on a stepladder uh, there was a muffled boom that was heard throughout the entire room. The guy fell off the ladder. Um, within 30 seconds, he had ataxia and disorientation. I mean, that I'm, I'm afraid to attribute that to radiation. I think that anybody that falls off a stepladder could have ataxia and disorientation for a little bit. He was admitted to the hospital 25 minutes after the exposure. Now he's semi-conscious, disoriented, um, had restless body movements. His skin turned purple, conjunctive were reddened. 10 minutes after admission, which is now, what, 35 minutes after the accident, he had his first episode of watery diarrhea. 
blood pressure was uh, 80 over 40, his pulse was 160 per minute, and his lymphocytes were totally gone. I mean, we'll hear about lymphocyte drop with radiation exposure a little bit later in this lecture, um, but that is common. His were gone after six hours. 30 hours after the accident now, he had restlessness, abdominal cramps. They gave him oxygen. He still was cyanotic. Um, eventually, he died from cardiac arrest at 35 hours after the exposure. So this sort of gives a picture of what you might expect in these um, uh, acute uh, radiation exposure accidents where the dose is extremely high. Um, I'm not going to talk that much about criticality. I guess uh, it's just important for you to know that um, criticality is uh, something that is uh, that, that can happen and allows for um, you know a, a sustained chain reaction to occur. Here's a picture of uh, what people believe that criticality might look like from a synchrotron. Uh, I'm sorry, from a cyclotron. Um, so an exposure system. There are a lot of other uh, criticality accidents, but we don't always have enough information to report on them. Um, the first one is the one that we just talked about, um, which is, uh, I'm sorry, it's the first case in here, the Doglian case, where he got fatal radiation poisoning. He dropped the tungsten carbide brick onto a sphere of plutonium. The second is Slotkin, who radiated himself during a similar accident, but this time with plutonium. Um, he, he died nine days after the exposure. We will talk about this criticality accident in Vinci, Yugoslavia, because these were the first bone marrow transplants that were ever done, and you need to know that. And then finally, we talked about um, this case, uh, just uh, the last case we talked about. His name was Cecil Kelly. He was working in plutonium, um, and uh, he, he got, 36 gray, but again, because it's plutonium, some of it's alpha particles, um, and so therefore it, it ends up being a much higher dose equivalent. The operators of the room did see a flash of light. His last words were, I'm burning up, I'm burning up, and he died 35 hours later. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Mayak nuclear power plant, but um, let me just mention the Mayak, Mayak accident. Um, there were two operators who were using, and this is a direct quote from their report, unfavorable geometry vessel in an improvised and unapproved operation as a temporary vessel for storing plutonium organic solution. Why you would do that is anybody's guess. Um, in plain words, they were taking the plutonium out from the wrong type of a container. This is again, that plutonium situation. Um, the, the, uh, it, it became very hot. The, um, operator dropped the bottle and ran, and they evacuated the complex. The shift supervisor then, I love this, deceived the radiation control supervisor and uh, attempted to pour the solution down a floor drain. This is what resulted in a nuclear reaction. It caused um, a fatal dose of radiation. It also caused for the radiation to be dumped into the local drinking water supply of the area. And so there are a lot of studies that are done with the population around Mayak, Russia. Um, I actually uh, visited the Mayak facility a number of times and um, there is huge contamination in that area. In fact, um, there, some of the major epidemiological studies are done with Mayak workers and, my, and people living around Mayak. Um, on uh, September 30th, there was a, an accident in Tokamura, uh, Japan. We will talk about this accident as well because we learned a lot from the death of the two workers that were involved. Okay, so um, that's all we know about CNS syndrome, not that much, and certainly no means to be able to intervene. Let's look at GI syndrome next. As I said, this is 10 to 50 gray of gamma rays or the equivalent in some other quality of radiation. Usually, death by three to 10 days, um, immediate nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. What's the cause? And why do we have a delay of three to 10 days before death? Um, it's because of the way in which the epithelial gut cells die. I'll show you a picture in a moment. 
Um, Chernobyl gave some examples of this, and um, they also have bone marrow symptoms, but they're not um, they're they're not as symptomatic for it. You don't see it. They don't live long enough. Okay, here's what's going on, and this is something you need to know. And this is going to be a theme that we'll see also in uh, in bone marrow. So what happens in the gut is that it is a self-renewing tissue situation. So as long as you have mature cells that are functioning, you have no symptoms because the mature cells are there, they're doing their job. What happens though, what are the most radiosensitive cells? They're the cycling cells. So we irradiate, we get irradiated here. The cycling stem cells die. As long as the mature cells are there, there's no problem. But as soon as the mature cells die, there's no um, stem cell to fill up their role and that's what creates the problem. So the reason why there's a latent period is that it's the length of the half-life of the mature functioning cells. As soon as they poop out, there's nothing left to be able to replace them, so then we have a problem. This is what occurs in uh, the gut. Here's kind of the picture of what this looks like. Down here are the uh, panath cells in the crypt, which are the stem cells. This is, as we move up, up, up to the top of the villus, we are becoming more and more and more mature until we get to the very tip where there is, uh, sorry, uh, where, where there is, um, where there are very mature cells. These cells die. Now there are no immature cells to replace these. And eventually we will get mucosal erosions here where um, material from the gut can enter and cause infection. So um, this is a critical thing. And we're gonna come back to this story over and over again because there's going to be a jejunal crypt cell assay that's going to be important for us. Um, there are a number of other assays that involve the gut that are going to be critical. This is sort of a diagrammatic um, uh, representation of what happens. Nice healthy gut has a deep crypt, a villus at the top. What does the villus do? The villus is involved in absorption of nutrients, absorption of um, chemicals that are needed for the body. Um, as the uh, irradiation takes place, these cells die, the villus starts to shrink, now there are no cells to replace the villus, and we get uh, these mucosal erosions. So in an irradiated individual, you would see these very short uh, villi. If you were to allow it time, and it, there was a possibility of recovering, some of these would grow back, and we would be able to see them. When enough of them are dead and no longer have no stem cells to replace, that's when we have um, uh, problems. Here is the, here are the actual histological diagram, uh, photos of it. Here is from, this is I believe a rat. This is the control animal. Here is 16 gray, five days later. Um, what happens here is the villi will become denuded. You'll lose these villi. Um, we won't be able to take up fluids and electrolytes as well as we could otherwise. We'll also have erosions that occur that allow for um, bacteremia to take place, and this will eventually contribute to death. As I said, there's no way to interfere with this syndrome. Um, there are some ways to improve it, but no, no way to be able to um, uh, fix it. Now, there are some people that believe that the best estimate of radiation dose is onset of vomiting, which is in fact a gut response. Um, this is a dose response curve look at, looking at the time after exposure versus the dose and showing that there is a pretty good correlation. But in any one individual, you're not going to be able to get a good readout of um, what the effects were there. Um, okay. Let's now, uh, I'm going to give you a background on ra radiation accidents. Um, for, and, and not just accidents, but radiation events that have influenced radiation thinking and radiation biology. Um, but I want to make a, a couple of points here. This information is not going to be just relevant now. It's going to be relevant when we talk about uh, radiation carcinogenesis and even when we talk about some of the other um, effects of uh, radiation, such as mental retardation. Especially J the Japanese atomic bomb survivor population is going to be among the most important population uh, for us to talk about. These, um, the data from this population are used for
uh, at dose estimates of consequences of radiation exposure uh, throughout the world. Um, so here's the story. Uh, the U.S. dropped two atomic bombs, one in uh, Nagasaki. Here's the epicenter of the bomb. Notice it's along the river. Um, notice that uh, as you go out further from the epicenter, you gain, you have more, um, your dose goes down, of course. So the highest dose was felt here. But there was also an explosion in this area that caused a significant amount of damage. This is on uh, Nagasaki today. This is about the site where the um, bomb dropped. This is actually outside my hotel room. Uh, and a couple of things to point out. Notice the bomb was dropped very close to a river. Um, the city has been built up pretty much uh, the way it was at the time of the bomb dropping. Um, so this was a heavily populated area. Notice also that there are these mountains. So when the bomb was dropped, the uh, plume occurred, but the fact is much of it stayed in this area because the mountains held back uh, the uh, material and left it more in the valley than in the mountains. And so Nagasaki got a pretty whopping um, effect. Uh, the, this, is, this is a story from Hiroshima I, I visited. I visited um, the Radiation Experimental Research Facility in Hiroshima like a lot of times. I've spent several weeks there. And um, I met this uh, Kodama who was um, an atomic bomb survivor. He did this book up talking about his experiences as he roamed through the city of um, Hiroshima after uh, the bomb blew up. He, he was actually in school at the time um, and he tracks his course. It's really kind of an interesting book. He was very friendly to Americans, which kind of surprised me after all this. Um, and with all the anniversary stuff that's been going on with Hiroshima, uh, 75 years now, there have been a couple of books that have been put out that have been kind of interesting and looked at uh, U.S. policy. Um, it, 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 I think radiation people should be aware of those um, events. Here's the Nagasaki bomb uh, blowing up. Uh, here is the aftermath in Nagasaki. Um, what I want you to notice are a couple of things. First of all, you know, the main part of the city was... Uh, made into rubble. Um, all the hospital infrastructure was totally gone. Many physicians died during this um, uh, event. There are a few people leaving the bomb site, but it's not all that many. Um, and if people were close, they probably died from thermal injuries and bomb blast, not the radiation effects. A uranium bomb was dropped in Hiroshima. Plutonium was dropped in Nagasaki. Um, this is a board's question. All estimates, I, I would say most estimates of radiation risk come from the studies of these two populations. The reason why is because they are a very large population, 120,000 people, and um, because we know an awful lot about the dosimetry. We're going to learn a lot about this population as time progresses and they influence our thinking. Um, to this day, the, we, the U.S. has a treaty with Japan where we have to follow their children and grandchildren um, to understand what the exposures were. A second population that we've studied, I'm not sure I would say we've gained as much information as we have uh, from uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, but a second population has been uh, those that uh, uh, were affected by the Chernobyl nuclear power plant meltdown here in Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian by background, been to Chernobyl many, many, many times. Um, the area where the meltdown occurred was here. It was due to mismanagement of a nuclear reactor. Um, the original evacuation zone was within a region. Now what the government has done is created an exclusion zone around this. Um, when the reactor melted down, there was a lot of radiation that was uh, a lot of plutonium was dumped into this neighboring pool. Um, so this is highly contaminated. And yet some residents go there and fish. Um, I'm not sure I would uh, advise it. Very close to the nuclear power plant was this town of Pripyat. If those of you have watched the uh, Chernobyl HBO series, lots of, some errors in that for sure, but the majority of the people they followed were living 
initially in this town of Pripyat. The way in which the world discovered this, uh, this radiation accident was uh, from the reindeer in Lapland. The reindeer herders noticed that the lichen were not available for the reindeer to eat. They didn't know what happened. They called up their government. The government now um, knew that lichen are highly radiosensitive because they are a commensal. They are two um, organisms living together and that uh, growth of them together is often um, uh, disrupted by stress and radiation was a stress. So this was the first report. Uh, the government in Finland started to do studies, found radiation in the atmosphere, and this alerted the world. I will tell you in the US, I think I, I, this is no longer classified. I was working at um, Argonne National Laboratory at the time, and we knew within minutes after the exposure, we had reports from Kiev of um, radioactivity on leaves, but we were not allowed to say anything. Um, here's the plant. The, the actual one that blew was this one right here. So this is a row of um, nuclear power plants and this one blew. It's sitting here on the Dnieper River. So it's very close to a river. Um, I won't go through it. This is the structure of the reactor. The US had only one reactor of this type uh, up at Pacific Northwest National Lab and closed it um, as soon as the Chernobyl reactor uh, blew, down, blew up. There were design flaws within this. I'm not gonna talk about the design flaws. And in fact, R1 in, at PNNL also had design flaws. What they did is they sent in radiation workers to um, take a, an upper biological shield and a lower biological shield and put these onto the um, radiation. They then added more materials on top of it to cover it up. Um, and that's what remains today. Um, in fact, that's what, ha what is the case at Chernobyl are, is that lower and upper biological shields. Um, out of interest, I'll mention just a few more things here. Uh, they have created an encasement for the reactor. Um, this was actually designed by Americans at Pacific Northwest National Lab, where what they did is they built this structure on wheels and then wheeled it over the Chernobyl reactor. The reactor is very hot on top. Um, it it's not possible to climb up there. You would die within minutes of exposure. Um, so that's why they had to create this structure. Here was the design. It's about the size of the Statue of Liberty and it was wheeled over and sealed the reactor in place. Um, this, is not, this is technically a temporary situation. Um, who knows how long this casing can last. Um, and certainly uh, something more long-term needs to be considered. I have a few um, images of the inside of the reactor that were taken by a camera that the Russians put in. The camera was of course destroyed by the radiation because the doses are so high, but here's some of the fuel rods that are still in position. Here's a fuel rod laying loose within the reactor. Um, here is some molten material that had melted out. Um, here is some metal that has melted through. Here's their mock-up of the reactor with the lower and upper biological shields and material on top. And this mock-up they did as a result of pr probing with the cameras, lots of damage that was done within the reactor, lots of molten material that is, is taking place. Um, this was the reactor taken, a picture I took before they put the uh, top roof on top. You can see that it was, they put scaffolding up. It was leaning over trees nearby, but they uh, allowed only pine trees because uh, leaves that were being blown oh, by the reactor would be too hot, very uh, hot up here on top. Um, but, you know, just sitting out in the open, you can take pictures. Nearby towns were vacated. I'm sorry, sorry, let's go. What happened? Where did this end? I'm sorry, I don't know what happened here, um, but let's go 
Uh, this is the town of Pripyat, which has um, the uh, has been abandoned. Uh, here's just another picture of an abandoned uh, hotel. This is one of my lab people actually uh, running around out there. Um, and this is an illegal picture I took of the reactor. Um, I snuck it out. You can see that there are workers there and that they're still running these reactors. But here's the net result, and I suppose uh, I'll try to highlight what I think you need to know. Um, 28 people died of acute radiation syndrome and 19 more died later. These were examples of where they gave bone marrow transplants. And what did they die of when they gave a bone marrow transplant? They actually died of graft versus host reaction. Why? Because most of them still had a little bit of bone marrow of their own left, and that attacked what they put in. So while a bone marrow and a control, a bone marrow transplant, a controlled situation where you can give a particular dose like you would clinically, it doesn't work so well in an accident where a portion of the um, marrow could be shielded, there could be a portion of the person's marrow left and able to mount a GVH response. So quite a few people died, but but still, despite everything, this is like, you know, what, 40, 40 people, uh, 40 some people died of the accident. Um, we're going to follow the cancer incidence in these uh, patients. Um, there was thyroid cancer in the children. It started to pop up within eight years, about 10 died. So it wasn't a large number that died from it, but there were 4,000 cancers that did develop. There was an increased incidence of leukemia. They predicted an increased incidence of solid tumors. It did not occur as they had expected. So um, it might be that there are different kinds of exposures um, that the uh, Nagasaki Hiroshima uh, experience could be really different from what was found uh, here with the Chernobyl accident. There were a lot of environmental situations and it was mostly about release of I-131 and cesium-137. And of course, where does I-131 go? It goes to the thyroid. And that's why we saw such a high increase of thyroid cancers. There was also significant psychological trauma with it. The exposure involved gammas, betas, and alphas. And so that created um, some of the um, uh, concerns. Um, they also, but, but when you look at the average dose, what is our natural background in the U.S.? It's about three millisieverts per year. These guys are getting 10 to 20 if they lived in the contaminated zone. That's not so bad. Um, this is 10 to 20 per year averaged over 20 years. Control, uh, people living in the control zone are getting even 10 times that. Evacuees had about 33 millisieverts. The only data I don't believe here are the data for the liquidators because the liquidators would often uh, lie about their dose so that they could have more uh, runs in and out of the reactor to make more money because they were paid per run that they did. There were mutant wild, wildlife that were found. Here's some pigs. Um, the Norway spruce experienced gigantism. The Scots pine became stunted. The birds, the great tits, had strontium-90 found in their eggshells. The common vole had smaller litter sizes and uh, lower lifespans. And when they could do it, the barn swallows had increased mutation frequency. Now, it needs to be mentioned that the birds were probably flying on top of the reactor, and the vole was probably burying itself under the reactor. So um, they probably had some pretty hefty exposures. Um, the spruce pines were... were um, spruce and pines were among the most susceptible to radiation. But if you go to this area today, you'll be shocked to find it looking very beautiful um, because uh, it's been untouched by humans for so long now since the reactor blew that um, it's actually, nature is very nice there. They have a tribute to the um, workers, the cleanup workers who died as a result of this, who gave their lives to try to um, save, uh, to try to uh, shore up the power plant so that others didn't have to die. Um, they have a memorial for them in a cemetery where their bodies were buried. They were buried in lead caskets to keep others from being exposed. But the net result was this. Um, they, uh, the radiation fell on the grass. The cows ate the grass. They made their way into the food. People ate it. The Radiation fell into the waters, the fish ate the waters, and it made its way into the food, and people ate it. 
So what happened with Chernobyl was there was not a very carefully controlled situation with regard to agriculture and many people were exposed through the foodstuffs. Um, the, the, I'll never forget, I tell this story all the time, I was there uh, right after Chernobyl blew, I had a handheld Geiger counter, I'm at a restaurant in Kiev and I'm eating this, and I'm, I'm, I test my beef and it's very radioactive and I say, why am I, what, you know, this meat's radioactive. And they said, yeah, yeah, it came from Chernobyl up there. And I'm like, well, why am I eating radioactive beef? And they basically said, you're eating it because you're a tourist. You're going to come in and be exposed for, you know, a few days. The rest of us, we have to live here. We don't want to um, expose ourselves to this. Okay, after Chernobyl, there happened Fukushima. Many of you will remember F Fukushima in 2011. There were no design flaws in this reactor. This is the same reactor that we have in most of our U.S. situations. It was really due to the natural disaster. It was earthquake proof. There was no problem with an earthquake here. It was the subsequent tsunami that flooded the entire um, power plant and disrupted everything. The contamination, again, was reported by the U.S. Uh, the, the, the Japanese government was not very forthcoming, um, particularly TEPCO is the company that um, they, they, they didn't really do the right studies. The U.S. sent teams to fly over, and as they were flying over, they had gyro counters and got measures of how much there was. It still, to this day, is dumping radiation into the ocean, but because the ocean is so big, it dilutes it out um, significantly. Um, there were accidents immediately after. Um, this is a view from the sky of uh, the destruction that took place in the area. Um, it was, here was the, uh, th this was the epicenter followed by the tsunami that created all the problems. Um, and this is the, this is where a lot of which number of studies have taken place. And again, the two main radionuclides are the same as uh, Chernobyl I-131 and cesium-137. Both are um, beta and gamma emitters. Um, I-131 is going to go into the thyroid and create issues there. But to tell you the truth, the doses from Fukushima have been relatively low. Um, and while there was all this worry about this radioactive plume that was going to hit the U.S., the fact was it was so diluted by the radiation, by the uh, water, the ocean, that while you could measure a little bit of radiation on the coast, it was only because radiation is so very easily detectable that we could even pick it up. Okay, so those are the stories of the accidents. Um, let's now uh, look at how they play into what we know about hema hematopoietic syndrome. Um, the, and I need to mention, um, Okay, the, the dose range here is two and a half to 10 gray, and it involves death of precursors for red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. But as I said, none of these are, are by themselves. I mean, you know, the gut syndrome actually begins at approximately six gray. So you're going to have some gut problems in people with hematopoietic syndrome. They won't die of the gut problems, but they will get some of them. So there's a big overlap in what symptoms you might find with each one of these. But most people believe the threshold for gut GI syndrome is six gray, although the major time period when they develop is 10 to 50 gray, or major dose period. Okay, what's the problem here? Death of the precursors for red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Mature cells are still circulating, but there are no stem cells. There's a second problem that occur occurs in the hematopoietic system that does not occur in others. You will remember when we were talking about the cells that are most radiosensitive, and we said stem cells are the most radiosensitive, and the most radioresistant are going to be cells that are not dividing and highly differentiated. But we said then that there was one exception. What other cell type is going to die here? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are mature, but they have no but they are extremely radiosensitive. They have a sensitivity down, D0 down around 80 to 90 gray, centigrade. So we can expect lymphocytes to die out, and then we can expect the stem cells to die out for the you know, red blood cell, white blood cell, platelet precursors. 
So that's going to influence our situation here. We'll talk about that in a moment. There is a thing called the LD50, which I'm sure you've heard of, the dose at which 50% will die. But in radiation, what we tend to do is we talk about two things. We talk about the LD5030 and the LD5060. The LD5030 is the lethal dose to kill 50% at 30 days. The LD5060 is a lethal dose to kill 50% at 60 days. Now, most often for animals, we use 30 days. Most often for people, we use 60 days. 30 days is probably too soon for people, whereas um, 60 days is probably unnecessary for most animals. In uh, Chernobyl, they treated about 200 patients with bone marrow transplants, and as I said, met, there were many failures there. What they found was much more successful was to use colony stimulating factors, and that's a board's question. We'll talk about that repeatedly in here. The colony stimulating factors seem to be quite um, effective for treatment of bone marrow syndrome. So the pattern that was experienced by these people was they would get, have exposure, they would then have chills, fatigue, there'd be a latent period for about three weeks, during which time the stem cells would uh, were, were dead, but the mature cells were still functioning. When there was no bone marrow regeneration, they would start to get mouth ulcers that developed, fatigue on the skin, and they died from infection, uh, inability to clot, hemorrhage, and anemia. So I'm going to tell this story, two case reports that are both in the um, bone marrow syndrome range that might tell a little bit more about what, how we're thinking about this. Um, so the first was a 48 year old male. He was working in Belgium um, at a facility. Uh, he presented with um, vomiting for four days and they thought he had a bad flu bug. They put him in the hospital. When they did all his workup, they found not just that he had low lymphocytes, but he had bone marrow aplasia. So now they're starting to say, look, this is not just typical flu. There's something else going on here. What could you have ever been exposed to radiation? And the guy says, yeah, yeah, I work with radiation. They go in, they double check his, the radiation he's been using. And here, his shutter had failed to close. So he was working in a situation where the shutter was up for a long period of time. Um, and his and exposure was about four and a half gray, well into the um, bone marrow syndrome. They did give him cytokine therapy. They gave him the colony stimulating factors at day 29. He responded, built up his lymphocytes at day 30. He had evidence of subclinical and cardiac, liver and cardiac damage. And we'll talk about that um, in a few moments because that suggests that it's not just about bone marrow, a single organ system failure, that there's a broader picture here. Um, he is alive and asymptomatic now, but he's still being followed um, uh, uh, through time. The second was an accident in Dakar. Um, I don't know how you lose iridium sources, but they lost an iridium source. Um, they actually threw it in a trash bin. It was stored, the, the, the trash bin was located near a workplace where, um, where the uh, employees like to go out and have a couple of smokes. Um, so at the end of the day, they counted up the number of people that were likely to be exposed, and it ended up being about 63 people. Um, Four presented with burns, so they had skin lesions, two had vomiting, and low lymphocyte counts. What, was, what were the dose estimates? 2.6 gray for one, 1.2 gray for the other. Probably they didn't need to treat the guy with the lower dose with cytokine therapy, but they did um, in order to be cautious. They treated them both with cytokines, they both responded, and again, alive uh, right, a, a, as of um, about six months ago. Okay. So let's get into what this LD50 is. You're going to need to know this for your boards. Here's the um, LD5030 for rhesus monkeys. This ends up being close to around um, four to five gray. So this is the LD5030 for monkeys. Here's the LD50 for a bunch of different species. Uh, humans are going to be in this range of two and a half to three gray, but I'll give you more refined numbers in just a moment. Um, monkey's pretty close to us. Dog is really close to us. 
a mouse is pretty far away, um, and one can wonder why uh, why we even use mouse as a model. Um, we'll talk in a moment. Uh, I'll show you just in a second why mouse is such a it has such a high LD50. Um, it's based in this idea. So if you were to repopulate the bone marrow of a human after it's been totally depleted, um, you would need about two times 10 to the fifth cells. If you were going to re replace a dog, you would need about two times 10 to the fourth cells. So this means humans and the dog have very similar situations. And in fact, dogs are really good models for human um, uh, uh, acute radiation syndrome. They develop the same kinds of leukemias that we do. They develop a lot of the same cancers that we do. Their prostate cancers look like human prostate cancers. I mean, you know, dogs, you know, they don't just watch our TV shows and eat our food. They really are uh, very much like humans. And that would suggest that there's an important role for environment in the radiation response. But here's the mouse down here. The mouse needs only two or three cells to replace its entire bone marrow. This is not at all the situation with humans. And this might talk about um, why there would be such a difference in dose, because you can think about the dose to irradiate a mouse and leave only two or three cells versus irradiate a human and have to leave back, you know, two to three times 10 to the fifth cells. Um, so what are some of the things that have been done with uh, humans? We're gonna see in a moment that the LD50 for humans is going to change significantly if we give a drug uh, like a colony stimulating factor. The drug that is probably among the most important is one called Nupogen. Uh, Nupogen is a combination of um, a colony stimulating factor and filgastrum, um, which uh, filgastrum seems to have a, an immunostimulatory capability. Um, we would never know this unless we looked in whole animals because nupogen would have almost no effect in vitro. Um, it doesn't, you, you can't measure an immune response very well in vitro, but in vivo you can. And so nupogen is used to improve lifespan after exposure. Um, this gives these dose numbers that I, we just talked about for dog versus mouse. But here's the pattern, and I think that this is useful. I have two charts of this. Um, they have pretty much the same information, but there are a few things that are different, so I'll try to emphasize them. This came from the um, International Atomic Energy Association or agency in Vienna. I actually know the group there. I work with them. I've given some seminars there, um, and when I go to the UN, I often visit the IAEA. Um, what are the things that happen for acute radiation syndrome? And I think these are, are things worth knowing that there is a drop in lymphocytes. It's mild at um, one to two gray. It's higher with higher dose. And finally, you can get to the point where it is uh, zero and there are no lymphocytes. So lymphocytes numbers are often considered to be a me measure of dose. And they are among one of the first things that drops following radiation exposure. So um, therefore, uh, of, of big significance clinically. Granulocytes drop. Um, they start dropping at early doses. And again, get down around this six to eight gray, you're gonna have very few granulocytes. When do we see diarrhea? Diarrhea appears rarely at four to six gray, but we sort of said that there's a beginning of a threshold for GI effects that's around six gray. And this is about where we start to see the di diarrhea popping in. Appalachian, it begins at much lower doses. Um, it begins kind of as a late response though. So if a person got a high dose, you're not gonna see it. Um, and uh, it can be complete even at, uh, at lethal doses. Um, latent period is going to decrease with increasing time or increasing dose. And this is an important thing that um, I would remember for your boards is, is hospitalization necessary? At one to two gray, we say not. At moderate doses of two to four gray, we say it's recommended. At four to six gray, it's necessary. At six to eight gray, it's absolutely urgent. And then over eight gray, it's probably not gonna change the course 
um, lifespan of the individual, but it will help with the managing of their treatments. This says kind of the same thing, but there are a few things to add in here um, that are a little bit different. Um, onset of symptoms kind of makes some sense. Here are the actual lymphocyte numbers that you can see. And down at this lethal range, we, have, we can be down to zero lymphocytes. Um, platelets, clinical manifestations, fatigue and weakness at the 30-day um, peri the period. Um, at the uh, moderate doses, we can start to see fever and infections. And this, of course, goes up. And out over eight gray, we can even see unconsciousness. For lethality, here are some of the uh, effects. And the medical response is usually prophylactic for one to two gray. Special prophylactic treatment isolation at two to four. Special prophylactic treatment from days seven to 10. Isolation, um, special treatment beginning on day one for the very severe. And then again, for the lethal, you can expect that you're only going to see symptomatic treatment. So these two tables, I think, are worth remembering because there are board's questions about many of these aspects um, in there. So finally, we get to the question is, what is the LD5060 for humans? Here are the data we have. Um, so first, we're going to look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why are we, wh what do we have to think about when we look there? There was no medical intervention. Remember I showed you that the hospitals are destroyed. Physicians were not able to reach patients. Um, very little medical care during that time. Um, and so this is going to be an untreated population. So there were four studies done. Uh, the RARF study, the Radi Radiation Experimental Research Facility in Hiroshima, uh, 7,600 patients. LD5060 was between 2.7 and 3.1. Now they do another study, also in Hiroshima, a very small study, but they look at students. Why would, did they look at students? Because in Japan, the best shielding is believed to be in schools. And this pushed the LD5060 up to four gray. Um, in Hiroshima University, they looked at people that lived 600 to um, 1,300 meters from the hypocenter. The kinds of homes that they were living in were, very, were not very well shielded. And there the LD5060 was 2.4. And then finally, uh, the US did a study in Nagasaki um, looking at only, you know, just under 100 patients. And they had an LD5060 of 2.9. So the average comes out to be 3.1. But on your boards, you should know that the range is anywhere from 2.4 up to 4. The board's question usually says, um, which of the following is closest to the LD5060 of a person? And they might put in 3.5, which is within the range. So um, I wouldn't learn the 3.1 number. I would learn the range of 2.4 to 4.0. Now, there was another now, I need to put in the caveat that a lot of this depends upon the kind of exposure. So here's Alexander Litvinenko. He was, I actually have a portion of his brain in my freezer. Um, he was assassinated by um, using polonium. Polonium uh, is, um, if you remember back when we were talking about um, uh, DNA being the, uh, gen gen the, the biggest target for radiation exposure, what do we say polonium was? It was an alpha emitter. So it goes in, he ingests the polonium, it hits his gut, it gives a gut exposure, but the, it doesn't go much outside the gut. So what's the thing here? He's gonna die of GI syndrome, but not have that much bone marrow syndrome. Um, so it's pretty amazing. The other group I had mentioned before were the Vincha, uh, Yugoslavia situations. Um, so Vincha, is a mm, nuclear power plant facility, but it's, it's, it's more to study nuclear power. And it is in the former Yugoslavia and Serbia, not very far from Belgrade. Um, there was an automatic safety switch that was installed. It was switched off and uh, the reactor got out of control and um, it wasn't noticed. So what happened was six people were exposed to radiation. One died within the first four weeks. The remaining five were transported to Paris, 
for bone marrow transplants. These were the first bone marrow transplants given for acute radiation toxicity, and remarkably, they worked. Um, here's just, I met with uh, several of the victims, so I got some information from them. Here's this reactor, which was a pride of Serbia. Here's uh, Tito standing with the workers um, in a picture I got from one of the workers there. Here's a page from his notebook uh, showing that they did a lot of work with Syrian hamster embryo cells. Here they are in France. Um, the, one of the victims is talking to his uh, nurses before um, the, the uh, bone marrow transplant. Here it is, he gets his bone marrow transplant. Here is the medical staff that was involved in doing all the work. Um, here's the cool doctor with his sunglasses on. Um, and here they are afterwards celebrating with champagne because it was such a successful procedure. Um, they're coming back on the train from Serbia and uh, the French doctors are heroes of the Yugoslav um, fatherland uh, uh, celebrating here. Okay, what do we learn from them? What we learned from the Vincha accident, first of all, it's claimed that they got four gray of radiation. Um, it was, uh, um, these were, the, the studies were done uh, on some of their uh, blood cells were done um, at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab in, in, in Tennessee. So we have the data, these became American data. Um, Four of them received four gray. It was probably more like eight to nine gray equivalent because there was contamination with neutrons. Um, they dropped out their bone marrow at 30 days, 32 days. They dropped out their bone marrow here. Um, both lead to uh, concerns about recovery of bone marrow cells. What did they do? at the places where you see the lines, that's when they gave a bone marrow transplant. And that, that's become the norm, is to wait until 60 days when the marrow is at its lowest point and give the bone marrow transplant there. In all cases, they were successful. In all cases, the patients survived afterwards. So they were great um, success stories. So the next um, three slides show you what happens after radiation exposure uh, to the immune system. And, I believe you need to know this for your boards. I'll try to bring out the most important points. So here you go. Person gets two gray exposure, total body exposure. First thing drops the lymphocytes. First thing they drop. Then neutrophils spike and drop. They reach their lowest point at 30, 30 days. Platelets drop, reach their lowest point at 30 days. And hemoglobin is just sitting around, no problems at all. Three gray now. Three gray. Lymphocytes are still dropping very early, when the first thing that happens. Second thing, neutrophils spike and drop, lowest point 30 days. Platelets drop, lowest point 30 days. Hemoglobin is still going down, but not all that much. In the 4.5 gray, which we already said is where the LD50 uh, uh, sits for these people, these people are going to die without any intervention. Lymphocytes drop, neutrophils spike and drop. Platelets drop, they all hit their lowest points at 30 days. Hemoglobin is now dropping as well, and these people will die. Here is a bone marrow from a person that's been irradiated. Um, here are the data on what the doses do for um, uh, leukocyte count inside them. Here is the drop uh, at different times, which has suggested, in fact, that people could be. Um, used here uh, the dose monitoring, one can monitor dose by looking at lymphocyte count, um, same idea here. And finally, we get to what is the LD5060 for humans with medical intervention? So we already said, if we give no treatment, what would the treatment be? No antibiotics, no bone marrow transplants, no colony stimulating factors. We're going to get between 2.4 and 4.0 as our LD50. So this is the range. But now, just put the person in the hospital and give them antibiotics and nursing care, you can push them up to seven, seven and a half gray. If we give them um, even colony stimulating factors, we might push that up even higher. Um, the range that we claim in the US that's eligible for bone marrow transplants, 
would be seven and a half to 10 gray. Um, I don't think that would be true in Europe based on the Chernobyl experience, but that's what the US says, and that's how I would answer it on your boards is seven and a half to 10 gray. Above 10 gray, we are going to make the person comfortable. We don't expect that they're actually going to be able to um, survive very well. I would remember those numbers. Okay, what are the treatments? Um, it's going to be whatever you would normally give for myelosuppressive cancer therapy, um, support a clean environment, broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, fluoroquinolones with penicillin or strep coverage of some sort. Um, the colony stimulating factors that would be recommended would be granulocyte CSF or granulocyte macrophage CSF. Um, so these colony stimulating factors would be very important um, and they would be given for a dose about up to 10 gray. And um, the platelet transfusions would be considered and then bone marrow transplants would be only for greater than eight gray. Um, what, do you, what does one find as uh, total body responses to uh, low dose and then higher dose in the next slide. If it's at 10 centigrade, there's pretty much nothing that you see. At 10 to 20 centigrade, that's when we can first start to detect chromosomal aberrations. At 12 gray, uh, 12 centigrade, we're going to expect to see a lower sperm count in some patients. At 50 centigrade, we now start to see uh, lower lymphocytes, um, so maybe some uh, bone marrow depression. Uh, at one gray, we're going to start to see vomiting, 1.5 gray. We might see mortality among the very, very vulnerable uh, babies, uh, the elderly. At 3.2 to 3.6, at 4.8 and 5.4, and then greater than 5.4, these are where we see um, uh, LD5060s. This, is, this was presented by NIH. It was prepared by IAEA, but these numbers are somewhat um, inconsistent with the ones I gave you before in Hall's textbook here of using bone marrow transplant above seven and a half gray. Here, where they say above 5.4 gray. I would go with the Hall's textbook and not these numbers, even though NIH provided these. But I will say um, that this shows you how much controversy there is in that area um, because there is tremendous controversy in what you can find. Now, I'm gonna point out a few other things that I'm not sure these will come out in your boards. I'll bring out the things that do come out in your boards. But one of the things I think that's um, a mistake in Hall's textbook is that there, it's, this is all presented as being three organ systems that fail. Um, but in actual fact, there is evidence that there is another organ system that fails, and that's the skin. So a lot of people would say that it's a dose is lower or higher than the GI syndrome. Um, I've seen both. Um, it's not caused by burns, but actually by true radiation damage to the skin. And in fact, I have a colleague in Germany who can identify uh, radiation injury compared to any other burns. Um, because they have a different histopathology. Um, there were some ex ex examples that were seen where the first things that were popping up in people were skin lesions. Um, I, I'll, I'll mention uh, uh, there was an accident in Goiania in Brazil where they uh, threw away a cobalt-60 source. Kids thought this was cool to play with and um, it was shiny and they got exposed. Um, many of them gave their lives after that. The uh, Japanese reactor accident that we'll talk about in a moment, the Tok Tokomura accident, where we'll look at the actual data. There was a Russian truck driver accident where a guy took a shiny stone, put it in the pocket of his truck as he was driving. It exposed his leg. He did not get any other symptoms except this giant lesion on his leg, which turned out to be a skin lesion. Um, even though he had total body exposure. And what a lot of people would claim is that as uh, the loose radiation sources are found more and more in the world, we can expect that we're gonna see more and more of these. Here is a Japanese atomic bomb survivor 
uh, this was a portrait that was done of him and he's allowing for his scars that he had for the skin, his skin injuries um, to be shown. So clearly this was not uh, recorded that well for Japanese atomic bomb survivors. Many of them were uh, reluctant to show these scars, but in fact, there are many of them that have, that were identified. Some are on the faces and you can even still see some older Japanese uh, that survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki wearing um, face coverings. Despite everything and all the accents we've talked about, this is an old uh, listing, but it says that up until about the year 2000, we have been working with radiation for a very long time, and yet we have only 70 fatalities up until then. And even after Fukushima now, we have, all, we have no more fatalities even after Fukushima. Chernobyl is already in here. Um, this is acute fatalities. This is not from cancer effects. Um, and you can see that there were several, and we've talked about a few of these criticality accidents. We'll mention the um, Marshall Islands. And one thing I will say is that this one, we have no report because we didn't follow up on it. We didn't do a study. So there may be a few more to add in on here, but still it's not overwhelming for as much as we've worked with them. So this is, I think, the better model. This is what's taught in Europe. We talked about the fact that their subclinical symptoms don't lead that far much more to um, severe problems. Then there, is a, there are a series of single organ failures, bone marrow, GI syndrome, and neurovascular syndrome. Well, what we teach in the EU course is that there is a multi-organ dysfunction syndrome that pops in around six to eight gray, and this leads to multi-organ failure. Multi-organ dysfunction syndrome is reversible, but the multi-organ failure is not. Here's some evidence for that. This is one accident in Najvij in Belarus um, in 1991. Um, here's the incidence of diarrhea against time. Here's diarrhea incidence. You can, there's no surprise there that it's sporadic, the diarrhea is gonna be a part of the um, gut problem. Here are the neutrophils, drop, come back up. But here we go, this person also had skin injuries that are not part of any of these syndromes. They also had um, um, respiratory failure, which is also not part of any of these syndromes. Eventually, a patient died, um, there was uh, gastric bleeding, and. Um, because it was sort of gone, so died probably of GI syndrome. But you remember those two cases, um, the, the guy who was exposed in Belgium uh, to the shutter being up on his radio, radio, radio act, his source, um, he had other symptoms. He didn't just have the major um, uh, bone marrow syndromes. He actually had some liver problems and some heart issues. So what a people would claim is that there's some sort of a poly organ insufficiency syndrome. Here's the accident at Tokomura in Japan. I actually knew the physicians that did this. Tokomura um, is up in Northern Japan. There is a big uh, power plant that's there. And um, they had, as expected, uh, they did a plutonium. Uh, they added two, two plutoniums at the same time instead of separately. They then got hematopoietic syndrome. They wanted to keep these, these patients alive. They thought they could maybe help them survive. Gave them a bone marrow transplant, uh, still had problems. Developed diarrhea, still had problems. Developed a skin syndrome, which involved erythema, blistering, and then a massive exudate. This is probably among the most important things that killed them was that they couldn't maintain skin integrity. They had lung edema, they had renal failure, and they had liver dysfunction that happened toward the end as well. So, you know, we, we don't, so I'm not sure, I don't think that the three organ failures are wrong. I just think that that story is incomplete. Um, here, here's acute radiation syndrome in primates, and we have lung issues, liver issues, problems in the gut, 
So I think the story we would say is that there's this multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, which can develop in um, two or more organs or organ systems um, that can be um, induced not just by radiation, but by lots of other acute insults. Um, there, it will lead to the gradual and sequential failure of most of the organs that, weren't, that, that are in the, in the body. It is a response to noxious stimuli, not just radiation, but chemical burns, infection, et cetera, et cetera. And what's interesting is that it's not the consequence of the insult itself, but rather what's the host's response to that insult. It's cl um, clinically, it ends up being tied to inflammation and the mechanisms are not known. Um, here, the, here's the idea. You have um, CNS, bone marrow, gut, skin, which are all part of the multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. But now we start to get lung, kidney, liver that are feeding into this, and that leads to multi-organ failure. What things modify this? It is about dose. It is about the quality of the radiation. Is it neutrons? Is it alphas? Is it gammas? It is about the heterogeneity of the dose. What's the volume that is irradiated? Um, and it's about the host response to the injury. So it's not enough that it's the um, injury itself, but it's how the host responds to it. So this is a model. There are a couple typos here. I got this from Nick Daniak a number of years ago, but I think it still is accurate. Um, so the idea is that there's a balance between a pro-inflammatory um, systemic inflammatory response syndrome and an anti-inflammatory compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome. And the pro-inflammatory is balanced by TNF-alpha, IL-1, 6, and 8, whereas um, the compensatory syndrome is, this should say transforming growth factor beta, IL-4, 10, and 12. And these compete for the two roles. And when you get too much um, uh, tipping toward pro-inflammatory, you get an inflammatory response. When you tip too much toward um, the compensatory response, you'll get an anti-inflammatory response. They can include things like um, fibrosis, for instance. So these two are kind of in, in um, disbalance when there's been, been a major exposure, and this leads to um, a lot of uh, concern.